let's start with the prayers. Oh. Oh. Sahanao bunato, Sahaviriam karavava hai, Ajaspina vadita mastoma bit vishava hai, Om shanti, shanti, shanti. Today we are going to start a new text and this text is called as Shruti Sara Samudarnam. This is a text uh, for our study. This is a part of the Prakarana Granthas. We have already finished some texts before in this series of talks. We took Brahmananda Valley first. Then we took uh, Vivek Chudamani and then also Naishkarmya Siddhi. In Brahmananda Valley, we have seen the essence of the entire Vedanta or the Upanishads, which says Brahma Satyam Jagan Mithya Jeevo Brahmaiva Na Paraha. This is what was said in the Brahmananda Vildi. And that is what we are trying to expand in these texts. What is the meaning of this? I am the observer consciousness, Chaitanyam, Brahma. And that is Satyam. Satyam means it is a reality. What I am experiencing is the world plus body and mind. They are of a lower order of reality. If they are of a lower order of reality, who am I? I am the same Brahman, which is Satya, which is pure consciousness awareness. So the lower part, the lower reality is called as the body, mind, world. The higher reality is called as Brahman or the Supreme Consciousness. This is the essence of all our spiritual study. Completely, any time we take a text, this is what we are trying to achieve. This is our destination. This is our goal. So in this Last text which we did was Naishkar Mesiddhi. It was by one of the disciples called as Sureshwar Acharya of Shankaracharya. Now, this text is also by another disciple of Shankaracharya. Now, these, these disciples have written books based on Shankaracharya's teaching. And Shankaracharya teaching is from his guru and his guru also got the teaching from his guru which was called as Gaudapadacharya. So the, it's, a, it's a teaching which is flowing from one guru to another, another sishya, the sishya becomes a guru, again it goes on, it passes on from generation to generation. This teaching is a very old tradition. It's a very old teaching. And Shankaracharya, as I explained to you in the last uh, session, he lived about 2,500 years ago. There's no exact date. There are many different texts which say different, different dates for his birth date and his, uh, where he lived and so on. But generally, it is believed around 2,500 years ago. That means not in this it is before the Christ, before the current uh, 
period which we are in. Now, uh, first we must try to understand who is this Totakacharya. And uh, in order to explain who he is, I will, uh, most of you who are in the field of study, of spiritual study, you, might, you may have heard a, uh, 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 something called as Totaka Ashtakam. There are eight verses which are in praise of Shankaracharya. And how, what is the story behind this Totaka Ashtakam? I'll just tell you in about a couple of minutes. See, so, uh, Shankaracharya had four disciples, direct disciples. And Sureshwara Acharya, Padmata Acharya, Padmapada Acharya, Hastamalika, and Totaka Acharya. These were the four disciples. Now, he used to conduct classes in the morning. The story goes like this, that he used to conduct classes in the morning. And then one day, Totaka Acharya was absent in the class. And then uh, the other disciples were wondering, why is Shankaracharya not starting the class? So he was waiting for Totaka Acharya to come, come, come to the class. At that time, Sureshwar Acharya, it seems, uh, not Sureshwar Acharya, it was Padmapala Acharya, it seems that he was saying, why do we have to wait for Totaka Acharya? You know, like we normally, if you are in a class, we will say that also. Why should we wait for another student to come in? Why don't we start the class? But he didn't stop with that. If he had stopped with that, it was fine. But he went on to say that Totakacharya is not, not a bright person. He's, he's not going to miss the class as such. He is almost like the wall. He's inert like the wall. That is what he, he said to his guru, Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya didn't like this very much. And then Totakacharya's earlier name was Giri, G-I-R-R-I. -R -R -I. And so he was actually, Giri's background was, he used to be uh, taking, uh, taking uh, the aspects of cleaning Shankaracharya's clothes, taking care of him. He was more from the seva, seva attitude, service. So when, when Shankaracharya was angry, he said, he then called out to Totagacharya, who was washing the clothes outside on the river. He called him out and then he, while he was coming back to the Kutir, Shankaracharya blessed him with all the Vedantic knowledge. And then as soon as he came to the class, uh, 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 Shank uh, uh, Shankaracharya asked him, where were you? What were you doing? And then he was, then he gave up this eight verses called as Totaka Ashtakam. These eight verses of Totaka Ashtakam are in praise of Shankaracharya. I will just play out the eight verses for you because this is a very, uh, a very beautiful uh, way in which a disciple praises his guru. You can see uh, there, there is another shloka also, Guru, guru, guru Strotram, which also is in praise of a guru. We will see here, uh, I'll play that uh, Todaga meter and I'll explain to you what that shloka means. Before that, just to summarize, Todaka Acharya was installed as the first Acharya, first teacher in Jyotir Matam. All these four disciples were given four schools to run for Advaita, to teach Advaita north, south, east, west, four schools in India. And his school was uh, a Jyotir Matan near Badrinath in the north of India. The text Shruti Sara Samudharanam. What does it mean? Shruti means Veda. 
Veda, which has got two parts, Veda Purva and Veda Anta. Veda Purva deals with the Dharma Artha Kama Purushartha. That means it deals with the goals which are meant for a householder. Vedanta is the last Purushartha. The, the end portion of the Vedanta deals with the Moksha Purushartha. So there are two parts. One is the first portion, first section, which deals with Dharma, Artha, Kama, which means how do you earn money? How do you enjoy yourself in different, different lokas, in the heaven, in the in different lokas? 14 lokas are there. How do you go rise uh, from one loka to another loka and so on? And the Veda Anta is the philosophy portion called as uh, the, uh, the end portion. And Sara means essence. Samuddharana means extracting, extracting the essence of Vedanta. That is the meaning of Shruti Sara Samuddharanam. On this text, there has been a very good commentary. It's in Sanskrit called as Tattva Deepika by Satchidananda Yogi. And this is in the style, usual style of the Vedas, Upanishads, where there is a guru and there is a shishya. There's a student and there is a teacher. And the dialogue they are having is not on worldly matters. How is, how is the economy doing? How is the, uh, how, 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 how is the situation outside? No, the, the dialogue is on the spiritual aspect. It is on Jivatma, Paramatma, Aikya. That means, what is the oneness between me and the creator of this entire universe? That is the dialogue which goes on. So this text is, consists of 179 verses, which we will see the breakdown in my uh, uh, following slide, uh, slides. And it is written in a meter called as Totaka meter. It comes in four lines. And this uh, meter is uh, quite difficult to, uh, difficult to chant, but still people uh, learn it and then they can chant the entire text. Anushtuk meter, these are all the meters in which uh, we have, we see in the uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita and so on, Anushtuk meter and so on. Okay, Tota uh, Ashtakam, I'll just play this maybe for one or two minutes. If you're interested, I can send this uh, audio to you. It will tell you how, how, how these verses are chanted. Vidita Kile Shastra Sudha Jaledi Mahito Just, uh, it won't take much time, just to give you a gist of what Totakacharya was and how, what a great affinity he had with Shankaracharya, his guru. The first verse talks about the expounder of the knowledge who was Shankara. 
So he's all these eight verses are in glory of Shankaracharya's teaching. And he says here, you are the great Upanishadic treasure. And I meditate on your lotus feet in my heart. That means you are there in my heart. I meditate on you. When a student meditates Shankaracharya in his heart, what he means is that same Atma which was there in Shankaracharya, because it is immortal, it is still there in this universe even today. If I meditate on the same Shankaracharya, I will also be become immortal. The second verse, save me from those heart who are afflicted by the misery of ocean or births and deaths. Now this is typically what is called as samsara, sorrow. So why do I meditate on the Shankaracharya, that immortal soul? Because I am also, this, I want to realize my immortality. And what do I get by getting this knowledge? The, the main thing is I get rid of sorrow, of repeated births and repeated deaths of the soul. The third, word, the third verse, it says that people have found happiness due to you. Due to you means due to Shankaracharya because happiness has come about by the inquiry of Atma Jnana. Self-inquiry, self-knowledge has given happiness because our inquiry should lead to the Atma, which is the nature of Atma is pure bliss. Therefore, the student is saying, I bow down to you, I, I, let me get this self-knowledge so that I can also be free from my sorrows. The fourth verse, he compares Shankaracharya as the avatara of Shiva. Shiva means the Lord who is the first teacher of the Upanishads to the entire humanity. And knowing this knowledge, I clear my delusion, the sea of delusion. And what is the delusion? The delusion is I am identified with my body as myself, the mind as myself. Therefore, Shankaracharya he is the one who is giving us this knowledge to remove the delusions permanently from our life. The fifth verse, it says that we have performed many, many types of sadhanas for the experience of Brahman. And he's here, he says, I am helpless because I'm still confused like all of us. He, we say we are confused so therefore, we seek shelter or we take refuge in a higher principle and say, give us this knowledge so that I can also be free. The sixth verse says that you are shining like the sun. That means the knowledge is illumining like the sun. Sun is always compared to knowledge. In Vedanta, sun is compared to knowledge because sun illumines the earth. And then all activities take place. Self-knowledge, the knowledge of Atma illumines the mind. It blesses the mind. And through the mind, the sense organs become active. So indirectly, what we are saying is the knowledge of Atma is the one which is controlling the whole universe. Sixth verse, that is what is the meaning. Then the seventh verse, he says, you are the best among the gurus. And there is no one equal to you. You are affectionate because you are teaching us. It's only through the compassion of a uh, compassion which a, a guru has that he has got himself free from sorrow. Therefore, he has that compassion for the other people and says, "Here is here is something which will be useful to you 
to get rid of and be free, be happy in life. The last verse, it says, I, I don't possess any other, not, uh, any other wealth. I have neither understood the knowledge, nor that I have the wealth. But you have the compassion and you can give me this knowledge. So in short, what these eight verses convey is basically knowledge of Atma is the most important for all of us to be free from sorrow. That is the essence behind this. And who can render this? The one who can render this is a guru. And what is the uh, what is the basis? If the guru is also not rendering it, he is basing the teaching based on the shastra. Shastra means the Veda, Purva, and the Veda Anta, mainly the Veda Anta portion. So that is about Totaga Ashtakam, the eight verses. Before we go to the text what the different features, what are the different verses. Generally what we say, I want to give you a little bit of introduction to what is Veda Purva and Veda Anta, which has been talked about in this introduction. So I have said this, that what the difference between the two parts of the Veda can be explained by four factors. Generally, whenever we take a text, the author who writes the text, he will have to answer these four questions. Number one, who is a Adhikari? Adhikari means who is a fit student who can get this knowledge? In the case of Veda Purva, the fit student is one who is interested in the world of enjoyment. That means he is interested in the three purusharthas, in the three goals of life, which is dharma. That means leading a life, a moral, noble life. Number one, one first goal. The second goal is how to earn money, earn uh, wealth for the uh, preservation of the body. And third is what are the pleasures which one can enjoy. I would like to have these three goals fulfilled. Therefore, I go to the Veda Puro portion. The Veda Puro portion is the mo more bulkier portion of the Veda. It can, it's it's uh, it's a uh, uh, almost I would I have heard this. It's about 70, 80 percent of the Vedas is only the Veda Purva. That means people were more interested to live and enjoy life, and they could find different different types of rituals in the Vedas, which will fulfill their needs. So this Veda Purva deals with Ragi. Ragi means one who is attached. Whereas Veda Anta deals with the fourth goal of humanity. These goals are very, very uh, universal. It, uh, it's a universal goals. It, it doesn't mean that you uh, Japanese will not have uh, this goal or a uh, or, uh, 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 people from Argentina will not have this goal. Their goals are very, very universal in nature. Moksha means what? Moksha means I want to be free from sorrow. Because again, sorrow is felt by all of us when we take this body. And I want to get rid of this sorrow of birth and death. That is the cycle of birth and death. Therefore, which is called as moksha. So the Veda Anta portion deals with viragi. Viragi means one who is detached. Detached from what? Detached from, after seeking all the goals, the three pur uh, the goals of life, then you become interested in moksha purusharta. That means I want to now know who am I. And then he wants to know what is the truth of the self. This self the soul who is living in this body has enjoyed whatever the world can give. The external world can give enjoyment, the external world can give wealth. You have 
uh, you have enjoyed the wealth, you have enjoyed happiness, which can be given by the world. But is it all, is a question which a seeker will ask. Is there some other goal for my birth or for me taking this body up? I see so many people living, passing away, living, passing away. Is there any goal which they have achieved? This is what people like Shankaracharya, people like Ramakrishna, uh, uh, Paramahansa, all these evolved souls, they have realized something which is a treasure. So that is the first part which talks about Adhikari. Adhikari means fitness of a person who is pursuing the text. The second aspect which a writer, author will look at is Vishaya. Vishaya means what? What is the subject matter of the text? The subject matter of Veda Purva is Anitya Vastu. Anitya Vastu means it is not, it is not permanent. So what we get? Wealth is not permanent. Pleasures are not permanent. So the 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 subject matter of the Veda Purva is impermanent knowledge about rituals, which will give impermanent pleasures, impermanent wealth. Because at the end of the at the end of the uh, life, one loses all of that. So what happens is you get samsara anuvritti. That means the cycle is perpetuated. The birth and death cycle is perpetuated because again you will be born for enjoying. Again you will be you'll take another body. So this cycle, birth, death, birth, death cycle, this is called as samsara that, perpetu that perpetuates because of this Veda Puro portion. The vishaya of the Veda Antha is nitya vastu. Nitya vastu means what? It is permanent, eternal subject matter. Why do we call eternal subject matter? Because it, it, uh, it gives cessation to the cycle of birth and death. This knowledge of Atma, once I have, the scriptures tell us that I can live permanently. I am, I become immortal. Not after death of the body, but now. Now, during the life, this life itself, I can realize that I am immortal. So the subject matter of the Veda, Anta, Anta means ending portion. And Purva means the beginning portion. This ending portion is called as Jnana Yoga. That means no, uh, the, the, uh, the pursuit of knowledge. And the Veda Purva deals with Karma Yoga and Upasana Yoga. Karma Yoga means how do we perform actions and get results. Then second part is how do I employ my mind in meditation, which is called as Upasana. So this second topic is Vishaya. So you must always, whenever you study any text, spiritual text, Next, you should understand what are these four factors and does it meet, does, has the author satisfied these four criteria before writing the book. The third factor is Sambandha. Sambandha means relationship. Relationship between what? Relationship between the knowledge which I get and the benefit which comes out of it. What it means is the knowledge from the Veda Purva is indirect knowledge. I have to perform action and then I can get the result. This is with reference to the Veda Purva portion. What happens to Veda Anta portion? This Veda Anta portion, that means the end portion, the knowledge I get out of this portion of the Veda is called as direct knowledge. And the benefit of this direct knowledge is I get immediate result. 
immediate result of removal of sorrow from life because I am identified, I learn how to identify with my Atma. This is the third factor. The last factor is Prayojana. Is there any benefit of this study? The benefit of the study of the Veda Purva is Laukikam. Laukikam means it's worldly. And then I can, the maximum I can do is I can, through the rituals and all the performance of uh, uh, different types of uh, karmas, I can go to heaven, Swarga. The Veda Purva uh, promises, like uh, other religions also, they promise us the heaven. But the only problem is that as soon as my punyam gets over, I have to come back to this loka again. That means my merit is finished for that. I may stay there in the heaven for a few years, but according to the uh, uh, law of this karma, law of action, of birth and rebirth, birth and rebirth, when the, merit, when the actions which are meritorious in my account get over, as mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, you have to come back to this world again. That is the way the Purva portion, the way the Anta portion is Moksha Palam. That means I get liberated while living. That is the knowledge of the end portion. So I think with these four factors, I, you will have an absolute clarity in future about what is Veda Purva portion, the ritualistic portion, and what is the philosophical portion of the Veda. The author here, Totakacharya, Sureshwar Acharya, uh, Nishchala Dasa, these authors, they go through these four factors before writing a book. And all the texts which we are doing, they are very clear that they have a goal. And when they write a text, you will find all these four factors are taken care and they are mentioned in the text itself. That this is text is meant for so-and-so. This text will give you so-and-so palam, fruit. In the end of the text, they will always say this is the fruit of studying this text. Okay, so now let us come to the proper text. I'm going to divide my uh, presentation into two, into two parts. The first part is going to be a summary like I always do for any text, I give you a summary. So I'll follow the same methodology. That is the first portion. The second section is the selected highlights of the text. I picked up some 25 verses. I don't know whether I'm going to do all of them, but we'll see how it goes and how you have the, how the interest is amongst all of you to continue this text in the highlight section. If there is interest, I will continue and then go on till the end. If there's not much interest, we will take it up later. We can see the summary portion. Okay. This text consists of 179 verses. It's a fairly, uh, it's, it's, it's a fairly uh, medium, medium text. We can take up these texts in future if required, but uh, uh, you know, normally I give notes for the classes and my notes are usually 200 pages. So for this text, I have two volumes of uh, notes uh, volume one and volume two, roughly the total number of pages of notes which I have written for this entire text is about 411 pages. You can find the entire two sections in the, uh, in the website. There are 411 pages you can download and read if you are more interested in some of the verses. Uh, this summary text, I have already sent you the the presentation yesterday. Uh, I have not sent you the highlights because I was not sure whether I'm going to do it, but let me finish the summary portion first. 
So verse number one to eight is introduction. And then uh, the main teaching in a nutshell is given from nine to 39. And a very important uh, distinction is made between Chit and Chirabasa. This text, uh, as you go further, you will understand is going to be a lot of dissection into our own mind. To go deeper into our own mind. You see, it is only when you do such these type of texts, you can see how deep one's mind is and how to go beyond the mind. That is the beauty of these texts because they have a tremendous depth in them. When you study these verses, you will find the difference. So one important area is Chit Chidabhas. What is Chit? Chit means consciousness. What is Chidabhasa? Chidabhasa means reflected consciousness. Consciousness is universal. It is present all, it's all pervading. It is eternal. It is all in, 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 in it's beyond time. That means it is not in time. It exists all the time. Whereas Chidabhasa, Chidabhasa means what? Reflection. This body and mind, they get a reflection of consciousness during the waking state and the dream state. The dream state, the reflection of the body is different. In the waking state, we have the gross body. In the dream state, it is a subtle body. What is the nature of the reflected consciousness which illumines the gross body in the waking state, which illumines the subtle body in the dream state, which illumines the causal body in the sleep state? That is the difference we are going to study. We have not seen this type of study in other texts. Then 40 to 104 verses, 64 verses, are talking about objections to this Chit and Chidabhasa. Objections. You see, the, uh, in advanced texts, the author himself raises a question and he himself will answer the question on behalf of a student, the author itself. So he will bring a Puro Pakshi. Puro Pakshi means objectionist. And then he will answer. He will raise a question. He will answer. He will raise a question. He will answer. This is the style followed in all the texts which I am which taking now. Uh, Naish Karme Siddhi has the same style. Shruti Sara Samudranam has the same style. The next text which I am going to do the Vichara Sagara is exactly the same style. There will be objections, there'll be replies, there'll be objections, there'll be replies. And by doing this, why how, what happens is we will our minds will get more sharper. Even though we may not raise those type of objections, then the objections are raised and answered, we learn better. And our knowledge of Atma becomes firm. Therefore, for people who have done the Gita, Bhagavad Gita, who have done the Upanishads, these three texts are prescribed because they already know the subject matter from the Prakarna Granthas like Vivek Chudamani, Atma Bodha, Tattva Bodha. Then they have done Gita and Upanishads. Now they are ready for these texts. That means they are ready to understand the finer aspects of how to resolve the conflicts in my mind. All of us will have conflicts when we are studying the Upanishads or the Bhagavad Gita because it deals with the subject which is very, very abstract and it's very difficult for one to understand in the initial stages. The next fifth section of this text is covering avastha trayam. 
and this is a very very important portion we will be the highlights are mainly from this section uh avastha trayam means three states waking dream and sleep the author is specialized in telling us teaching us that these three states belong to the mind it does not belong to the atma atma is free all the time atma is shining all the time but the three states they belong to the reflected consciousness in the three bodies therefore i the i the atma am ever free from the mind which takes up the three states and it gives up the three states very very beautiful portion this is the this is a unique presentation for those people who want to learn the difference between consciousness and mind many of you who have done the upanishads with me had expressed to me and there were a lot of difficulties to differentiate the mind from consciousness a text like this done carefully it will take time to do a text like this which will take you at least one year if you do it regularly every day it will take about a year for you to finish this text of 179 verses but it will sharpen your skill in understanding vedanta you can go through the text independently and study and see how it uh, how, how how it goes deeper and see ultimately the whole uh, the whole study is based on the mind and the mind is something which is not firm it cannot understand sometimes it is it is always it is always wandering it has got many problems in it but then we need to clear slowly the the uh, uh, the confusions in the mind the impurities in the mind and then when the impurities become less and less confusions become less and less the obstacles for the knowledge are removed and then what happens is this knowledge becomes very clear many people who listen to the spiritual study in the initial phases they have obstacles their own obstacles that means the mind has the obstacles so they are not able to understand 99% of atma in the initial stages to me also it was the same i struggled in the 15 15 years or 18 years of my initial study to understand what is this atma how can it i be atma and so on but study of these type of text has helped me i'm sure it will help you also therefore i'm i've taken this text just as a, as a summary so that you also get a glimpse of this the next sixth section deals with why anatma is mithya this is an important portion of the entire spiritual study because one thing is to know that i am atma but that is not a complete study it is it, the study never gets completed just to know by knowing i am pure consciousness i have to know that how do i see this world because i have to face the world even after knowledge so what happens is i have to answer the question what is this world what are the experiences which i am having every day of life and that portion is dealt from verse number 114 to 156 very in depth study of how i can say that the world is an appearance it is not reality it is not existent but it is an appearance i use two words all the time existence is atma appearance is body mind world always remember the two simple two words existence means it exists in the past it exists now 
it will exist after the body is left the uh, left uh, the world what is appearance appearance is temporary it depends on the mind the the three states of the mind is what is called as appearance the seventh section is nididhyasana after having gone through the mahavakya portion mahavakya means the oneness the central theme of this entire text is i am one with the creator i am the only consciousness principle which exists all the time whereas the world is an appearance this entire this central portion i have gone through this till verse 156 after that how do i uh, how do i uh, get this knowledge in me that is through nididhyasana nididhyasana is a practice of meditation vedantic meditation which we are doing on saturdays i finished 15 meditation sessions so far for the saturday class all those 15 sessions are nididhyasana whatever i study about atma i try to uh, see that in myself i try to differentiate between my mind and atma so that is what the author does between 157 to 170 in the last one uh, 10 verses of 179 1 to 9, 979 is basically thanking shankaracharya for this knowledge totaka acharya thanks his guru and says uh, glorifies the guru glorifies the teaching and says whoever studies this text again and again he will realize the the ultimate truth which is atma so that is the entire summary so i've taken almost 45 minutes for uh, giving you a brief introduction uh to the text and uh, also a birds eye view of what the text is now i will go a little bit more on each topic that's what is what i plan to do today i will go through these topics a little bit and tell you a little bit more then we'll take up the highlights so in the first eight verses as i said straight away the guru tells the student your nature is moksha this is the this is the style of a guru in the next text which we are going to do exactly the same thing is the same style is follow in vichara sagara the guru the shishya the student comes to teacher and says i want to be free from sorrow that is how a student will go i mean i as a student will go to a guru and say i want to be free from sorrow and uh, normally there are two types of teaching one type of teaching is the teacher will take compassion he will take uh, you know he'll say oh okay student i understand you have a problem you i then he will tell he will teach the student in one style that style is called as adhyaropa apavada that means he the student expresses his sorrow the teacher will say yes i know you have sorrow i let me remove the sorrow one by one let me teach you you are not the body you are not the mind and so on this is one method the first is adhyaropa superimposition of the sorrow on the atma then the second method then the second step in that same method is apavada apavada means negation that after teaching that you are a difference between atma and anatma he negates the anatma portion which is called as apavada this is one method but here the method is what straight away apavada starts guru tells him you don't have sorrow 
your nature is your happiness and that is all so straight away he will say you are atma in the vichara sagar also the same style is followed i will talk a little bit more in depth there also so your nature is atma but the main obstacle you are facing is two main thoughts and what are the two thoughts number 1 aham aham means ahamkara i notion in the mind and the second is i notion is mainly with the body with my own self my own self means what i look at myself and i say this body is me the mind is me this intellect is me i am sorrowful i uh, have lot of uh, uh, anger in me lot of uh, emotions in me so i this is called as ahamkara i am 50 years old i am 30 years old i have pain in my body these are all ahamkara then what is the second one the second thoughts are mamakara mamakara means the world i am attached to the world the family belongs to me the wealth belongs to me the company belongs to me so these are the obstacles they say for the knowledge of atma anatma is in which we have aham and mama anatma means what we not atma and what are the five uh, five anatmas the popular five anatmas whenever we talk about anatma atma we know atma is the consciousness anatma means what is not the consciousness is number one our body physical body number two the mind after that comes our possessions our profession our family these five thoughts thoughts belonging to these five ahamkara and mamakara occupy 99% of our experiences 99 you can think about it you can you'll come to the conclusion you will come back and say this five are the main topics which i think about almost throughout my life my family my own body and mind my profession and my possessions that's it body mind is ahamkara possessions profession family is mamakara so that is described in verses 1 to 8 then the next one is how what is the project in this uh, project which a student has to do the project is he has to drop the anatma that means the jivatma status when do i become jivatma when i identify the i the soul in this body when it identifies with the body or the mind or it identifies with the other three the world then it is called as jivatma suppose the same jiva learns to drop these five then automatically the jiva becomes paramatma it becomes free from this anatma the moment you have become free from this five fold bondage you are liberated this viveka this discrimination between atma and anatma is the first part of the project then the second part is learning to say that this is all done intellectually learning to say that once i have dropped this five what remains is that atma pure consciousness pure awareness that awareness principle is the same as the paramatma the nature of the entire universe is pure consciousness which is basically said when i refer to the you, uh, myself it is called as chit consciousness when i refer to the whole world of things and beings it is said sat 
So the Sat and Chit are the same. That is what is the Mahavakya. We will study a little bit more in depth once we go into the other verses. At this point of time, oneness is revealed at the level of consciousness and existence. When it comes to the world, I say everything is, everything is existing, is, 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 the whole world. The, the you know, uh, you can say Singapore is, you can say the, uh, uh, the water is, the rivers are, everything is, 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 is. So the easiness of the world does not belong to the world, it belongs to this higher principle which is called as Sat. So when I do this project, what happens is, I take the three bodies and I put them together and I say the three bodies, which is the gross body, the subtle body, and the causal body. The causal body, as you all know, is the my own status when I am in my sleep mode. You know, when I'm sleeping, that body which I am, is called as Karana Sharira. So these three bodies, they are only clubbed together and they, we say they are Anatma. And who am I? I am the pure, impure, uh, I am the pure consciousness. Whereas the mind is impure. Body is impure. Karana Sharira is definitely impure because it's got all the seed. That is the seed from where these two other bodies come. Now, let us try to understand a little bit about Chit and Chirabhasa. Chit, as you know, is called as Sakshi I. Sakshi I means it is not involved in the transactions. First thing you should know is it is not, Sakshi means something which is not involved in the transactions. What is Chidabhasa? Chidabhasa is the reflected consciousness. That means there is consciousness like you have the sunlight. When it gets reflected in a bucket of water, the same sun is appearing in the bucket. That reflected sun is called as Chidabhasa. It's called as the same consciousness when it gets reflected in the body is called as reflected consciousness. That reflected consciousness is called as I thought. This is the first thing we should understand between Sakshi I and Chidabhasa. Then the other things become simple. Once you have understood the basic thing, Sakshi I is not involved in the transactions. The Chidabhasa, reflected consciousness, is involved in all transactions. The moment I wake up in the morning, what happens is that pure consciousness, which was there during sleep, which was illumining my sleep condition, now it is illumining the waking mind. The mind was sleeping, the mind has woken up. When the mind was sleeping, the thought was, I don't know anything. I don't know myself, I don't know the world. These are the two thoughts in our sleeping mind. Who was illumining that sleeping mind? It was the same chit. Now, the same mind is getting up. The moment it gets up, immediately what happens? The I thought comes. First is the I thought, for all of us, universal. You may be in Mysore, you may be in Singapore, you may be, you may be in London, anywhere, it is the same. One I thought will come, which is called as reflection. This process of, this is called as the technical portion of Vedanta. If you understand the technical portion, then what happens is you become very clear about Atma and Anatma. If this technical portion is not clear, then you will always be in confusion. How can, I, how can this be possible? How can I be this? How can I be that? Conflicts will always be there. This, therefore, I'm taking this in depth. 
this text is predominantly technical by nature technical vedanta okay the second thing what happens is the chit blesses the mind with chidabhasa and then i get a feeling i get the notion i am the notion comes to the body and mind and then i become the observer the sakshi i by itself doesn't have the i am also there is no notion only when the chidabhasa comes you should know that the second process starts observer it becomes the observer origination and resolution ground for the ahamkara observer is the ahamkara and sakshi has no connection with the ahamkara it only lends the reflection to the i notion this is what we should know about pure consciousness that means the sun is illumining all the actions are taking place the sun still remains the earth goes round and the sun nothing happens to the sun it is always there there is no nothing from the viewpoint of the sun there is neither day there is neither night from the viewpoint of the consciousness there is neither waking dream or sleep because it is always there this is an example which we are given when we try to learn vedanta from the point of the earth from the point of we from the earth we say there is day and night so from our point there is ahamkara mamakara because the mind is uh, woken up it sees the body yes there is ahamkara there it's uh, it has relationship with the world yes there is mamakara that's it but with reference to that reflected consciousness yes there is relationship with the world but with reflected to the pure consciousness there is it is called as asangaha very important point which we have seen in brahmananda vadi the first thing which was taught there was asangoham asangoham is the nature of consciousness this reflection gives the sentiency to the mind and therefore the mind becomes conscious so in, when we get up in the morning what happens we, our mind becomes conscious immediately all our sense organs are woken up and then the moment my eyes are open i know i am living in london i am living in singapore i am living the the entire the location comes to the body and mind as pure consciousness as atma when i was sleeping there was it was location less consciousness pure chit chit has no location it is all per that is why we say all pervading there is no location means what it is everywhere it is nowhere it is everywhere there is no time and uh, uh, there is no time space principle with reference to chit chidabhasa has got time it has got space it is located so the sense so this portion we must be very very clear the sentiency for the body is given by the mind mind gets the sentiency from atma the body this is nirdeshya viveka from consciousness pure consciousness mind gets a reflection it gets the power sentiency means the power of knowing power of doing power of uh, desiring ichha shakti kriya shakti jnana shakti these three shaktis are basically the powers which come to the mind first from the mind it is lent to the sense organs to the body and to the entire universe ahamkara is a property of mind it is not my property my property is means not an attribute of atma it is an attribute of the mind it comes uh, why do we call it is as an uh, uh, this ahamkara why do we call it is not a property of the uh, of the aham which is consciousness it because it comes and goes we will be seeing more details of this in the analysis portion 
then we do the highlights. Why this Amkara is uh, uh, is is uh, uh, why the reflected consciousness plus the mind comes and goes because it comes in Jagrat, it goes off in Sopna and it goes off in sleep. In Sushipti, what happens? The mind and Ahamkara they both get resolve. They got, they both resolve into Atma. All problems belongs to the Ahamkara, which is Ahamkara is nothing else but like a Chaya. Chaya means shadow. In Kathopanishad, we have seen this example. Chit Chaya. Those who have done Kathopanishad with me will remember. There is one verse there which tells that ego I is nothing but a shadow. It's a shadow of the consciousness. So I should, I, or throughout my waking state, I'm living with a shadow of consciousness. I conduct all my activities with that shadow, with the ego eye. Ahamkara has no connection to, has a connection to the mind and uh, through the mind to the entire anatma. So these two portions, please, if you're not clear, you can ask questions. Get it one time clarified so that you understand the principle of what is consciousness and what is reflected consciousness. Very important point for you to study the Bhagavad Gita. In the second chapter, Lord Krishna says, Na jayate nam riyate va kadachit nayam bhutva. We have seen that verse before. So, when Lord Krishna says, na jayate namriyate va kadachit, that means Atma, he is referring there to Atma, pure consciousness. So there, if you don't know the difference between Chit and Chadabhasa, you will always be in trouble. And you will never know what this Gita is talking about. Okay. Next is 40 to 104, three objections by the opponent. How do you say there is oneness between Paramatma and Jivatma? Paramatma means it's a totality. That means there is only one conscious. How do you say there's only one consciousness? And why do we need this Mahavakya? By meditation, now I can become Paramatma. I can just drop myself and become one. By meditation, meditation will give me the uh, will give me the benefit of what you are talking about, jnana. Why should I go through the Vedanta portion? I will do karma. I will do upasana. Upasana will give me the benefit. The same type of reasoning we saw it in Nishkarmi Siddhi also. Now this objection is called as Vidhi Vakya. Vidhi means it says in the scriptures also that you know you meditate and you will get the result. What Totakacharya says, his answer is any karma any action is will give you a result which is anitya this is a law suppose you walk suppose you uh, you, you walk for some time it will you will reach a particular destination so you will reach a particular point but then you will not reach uh, suppose you start walking from here from singapore you start walking you will reach maybe up to angmokyo but then you will not reach the other end of the world this is karma phalam. That means the result is 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 uh, uh, is finite. It's not infinite. Knowledge. So what it means here is any karma, even meditation, is a karma. Is a is a uh, action done by the mind. So through meditation, one cannot get the oneness. You must go back to the shruti. It is the knowledge which is said, you have to use the, the Shruti as a Pramanam. Shruti means what? Shruti means Veda. And say that Veda is telling me, uh, I am the pure consciousness. I am one with the entire universe. That's all. And I accept it. And then I live my life. There is one, one consciousness in the entire universe. From that consciousness only, the whole world is coming, going, bodies are appearing, disappearing. 
waking state, dream state, sleep state, coming, going, all this is coming with reference to that consciousness. So knowledge is important, Mahavakyam is important. Mahavakyam is important because that only teaches me this oneness. <coughs> second point, second objection. The second objection is this Mahavakyam, that means Tattvamasi, Aham Brahmasmi, is it a stuti? Stuti means is it a glorification, a figurative expression? This is one of the opponents. They are all opponents to the uh, to the uh, knowledge coming from Veda. They say karma can give, Upa, meditation can give me everything in life. Doing an action can give me all results in life. But here again, what uh, Thodakacharya says is action cannot give you liberation. Knowledge can give liberation. So it is not a figurative expression that you are God. God, you are, it is not like glorifying you and say, okay, now Jacqueline is God, or I know uh, Vijaya is God. So it's not, it's not glorifying somebody. Tatvamasi is not a glorification vakya. It is a truth. It is a fact. See it as a fact. It is a primary meaning. That's what Totakacharya says. It is not a secondary meaning. It is not. Uh, it is not for glorification. It is a factual statement. And the benefit of accepting the, it as a fact gives me the benefit of liberation from this body and mind. This is the guna. Guna means it's a. It's not. A, it's, it's called as. Uh, it, it is a, it's an objection that it is a guna, it is not a, it is a stuti. Stuti means glorification. So tattvamasi or you are, you are that one atma is not a glorification for you. It is a factual reality. Then the third objection generally which is raised in, uh, uh, by the opponents like all other philosophers, they all raise these type of questions only. Like Visishta Advaitam, you know, the, like the other um, philosophers. Jiva, okay, this is a very, uh, very uh, a, a typical uh, question by an opponent. You say Jiva Atma is Samsari. Samsari means he is sorrowful. And you say Jiva Atma is equal to Paramatma. And of course, when you say Jivatma is going to Paramatma, that means that is, I accept it. That means you are uh, the higher principle. Now, he says in the equation Mahavakyam, it says Jivatma is going to Paramatma. Why can't we take it that Paramatma is Jivatma? You are saying Jivatma is Paramatma. Why can't you take? that the Shruti is saying Paramatma is Jiva. And then what happens if Paramatma is taken as Jivatma, what happens? That means the creator God is also a Samsari. He is also sorrowful exactly like me. He is a Maha Samsari. It means he is a bigger, more sorrowful person. Then Todakacharya says, this, this, this is a funny reasoning. If that is the case, then there will be no moksha in life at all. Veda will never talk about liberation because there can never be liberation in life. And therefore, he says that Jivatma Paramatma Aikyam is the reality, is the oneness, is the reality. And taking Jivatma equivalent to Paramatma, Paramatma is not, Paramatma means it is the totality, it is the total principle, the higher principle. If that, that is not sorrowful, that is free from sorrow. Why it is free from sorrow? We are seeing it in Rigdrishya Viveka. It doesn't have the wheeling power. Whereas the Jiva has the wheeling power and the projecting power, Vikshepa Shakti and Avarna Shakti. That's what we are seeing in the next Saturday class also.
So here, so the, the, uh, coming back to this uh, objections, Viparita means opposite. So it is not that uh, Jivatma is equal to Paramatma means that he is also sorrowful like me. These are, this may appear simple to you, but these are the ways in which we can learn about a deeper aspect about Atma. Avastha Trayam is the property of mind. That is what is explained from 105 to 113. In the highlight portion, I will talk more about it. Avastha Trayam means what? The three states of consciousness. That means the waking state, dream state, and the sleep state. They are the property of the mind. It is not the property of Atma. Avastha Trayam is also as a, is included in Anatma. So what he says is never identify mind as me or mine or mind as satya. Don't identify mind as satya. It is satya means what? It is real. The moment I consider my mind as real, then it's a problem. Mind is an appearance, it comes and goes. I get a lot of delusions in the mind. I get sorrow, I get joy, I get delusions, I get so many different types of uh, uh, agitations, so, so many different, but it is not Satyam. Satyam is what? Satyam is Atma. Only one Satyam. Mind is Mithya. Mind is an appearance. Mind also is a part of the created world. It is to be included in the world and therefore it belongs to Ishwara. We must understand this body and mind which I have has been lent to me, has been given to me by God so that I can realize my real nature of oneness with that higher principle called as pure awareness, consciousness. Then, so there are, we have to use the mind to claim I am Sakshi Paramatma. Sakshi Atma. How do, I, how do I say that the mind is not me? We use the five point logic which we have studied in the Naishkarmi Siddhi. For those who attended the Naishkarmi Siddhi, these five points must be very clear to you. This is a repetition of what is being taught in Naishkarmi Siddhi. Drishyatvam, Bhautikatvam, Sagunatvam, Savikaratvam, Agama Pahitvam. Five features. Remember this, like I explained to you last time also, these five features, whenever you want to discriminate, differentiate in the seat of meditation, remember these five points. Drishyatvam, mind is seen. Therefore, it is not me, the Atma. I am the seer. Bhautikatva, mind is made up of five elements, subtle elements. I am Atma, I am not a part of the elements. I am apart from the elements, I am the spiritual principle. I am not matter, I am the spirit. Bhautikatva. Mind is sagunam. Sagunam means it has got qualities. Gunas. Sagunam means it has got gunas, attributes. Whereas me, I don't have any gunas. The scriptures, Upanishads teach me I am nirgunam, I am a bhautikam, I am a drishyat. I am not seen, I am the seer, I am not the five elements. I am the spirit. I am not with the gunas. Mind is chanchalam. It is moving up and down. Sadikara. Chanchalam means it is, keeps on jumping up and down, up and down. So when I sit in meditation, how do I differentiate between me and the mind? You just have to say I am the Sakshi. I am the Atma which is not changing. I sat yesterday, I sat day yesterday, I sat last week in meditation. I am the seer. The seer has not changed. Last week also I saw my thoughts. Yesterday also I saw my thoughts. Today also I am seeing the thoughts. So what has happened? The thoughts have changed. And who is changeless? I the Sakshi, I the seer. Very, very simple point. But we have never given a thought to this. This is a 
beauty of Vedanta. Simple teaching of these five points is enough for me to understand I am the Atma. Everything else I experience is an Atma. Agama Pahitva means it comes and goes, comes and goes. It comes in waking state, it goes off in sleep state. It again comes in dream state, again goes off in sleep state. Again it changes, the mind changes. So with these five points, I can draw my identification with the mind. Therefore, I can say that these three states also belong to the mind. Therefore, I can say the three state is not me. I am the pure Atma consciousness. Atma is exactly the opposite five features. I just told you the five features. It is the seer, not the seen. It is spirit, not the matter. It is nirguna. That means it has no gunas, but the mind has got gunas. It is, uh, mind has got modifications. Atma has no modification. I am the same seer. In the childhood also I was a seer. In the middle age also I am the seer. In the old age also, body is changed, but I, the consciousness has not changed. I, the awareness has not changed. It's very easy to understand Atma. I'm telling you, please apply these five principles. That it is not at all difficult to understand the spiritual science. If it is taught methodically, step by step, and you follow the instructions as taught by Shankaracharya, very easy to understand. I am nothing but, I cannot be anything except consciousness. You will, you will be surprised and you will tell yourself, how did, I, how did I ever mistake myself to be the mind? That is what the question which you will get when you finish the study of Shruti Sahara Samadranam. Very, very beautiful text. Project is, I told you, is to drop the mind, separate the mind as not me. Mind is not Satyam. Satyam means what? It always exists. Even in sleep, the consciousness exists. I am different from the mind and amkara, and I have to drop the property of the mind, which is the three levels of consciousness, and say that I am different from the three states. I am the Turiyam. I am the fourth state. Fourth state with reference to the three states, which are relatively coming and going. Turiyam is called as consciousness. Then, then what do I have to do? I have to only claim that I, was, I am Avastha Treya Sakshi. I am the uh, seer of the three states. Therefore, I am one with that ultimate principle, which is Brahman. The, why do we use the word Brahman? Brahman means it is a it, the whole world is becomes a seer for that one Turiyam or Brahman, which is beyond. That means there is only one. It is not a part of the three states. It is not the property of the three bodies. It is a different principle. It is a separately existing principle. Very beautiful. Then, uh, 114 to 156, why Anatma is Mithya? This is a... Uh, the second portion of our analysis in the Mahavakya. One is the Atma and Atma Viveka, differentiating between Atma and Anatma. This is the second portion, which is a tougher portion. To accept Atma and Atma is easy. Okay, I am the consciousness, I understand. Now, the difficult portion, which is very difficult for all of us is, how do you say that this creation which I see is an appearance? This is the uh, topic of Mandukya Upanishad, chapter 2 and chapter 3. Advaita Prakarana. Vaitatya Prakarana. These two Prakaranams, the two chapters, are summarized in this text from 114 to 156. 
if you understand shankaracharya and his disciples throughout the uh, writings of shankaracharya or his disciples you will always find a reference to mandukya upanishad because shankaracharya's guru's guru has written and he was the proponent of mandukya upanishad and he has written beautiful commentary on the mandukya upanishad which was which has come from to shankaracharya from his guru and therefore you will find that totakacharya sureshwaracharya padmapada acharya all of them take they talk about this three three states of consciousness which is the waking dream and sleep this mithya is i will explain more in details when you see the highlights and the, this mithya is the central topic of discussion in vichara sagara in the next text which we'll be doing this uh, this particular portion is dealt in almost like 200 300 verses okay mithya means what it is appearance it is not sat sat means existent all the time asat means it is not at all existent and the third category is appearing and disappearing like the rope snake like the mirage water on the sand like the dream which appears and goes so they say that the entire waking is also like that the universe which includes the body mind sense organs which is clubbed as anatma is non substantial is only name and form and uh, in chandogya upanishad they take the example of a pot and clay clay is compared to the observer principle the sakshi the consciousness which is like the clay pot is what it is an effect it is an effect of clay it is coming out from clay it is only name and form it is karyam karyam means effect it's a product clay is the cause so with reference to the world i can say i am the cause of the world i am the cause means i am the awareness principle and then the this is one level of study i am the karanam in taitri upanishad it says very clearly that from which beings are born that which having been born these beings live continue to exist and into which when they depart they all enter very very important pramanam of the upanishad to say that there is consciousness what is the proof that there is consciousness this is the verse yato va imani bhutani jayante yena jatani jivanti that means it is the same like uh, kaivalya upanishad the 19th verse there that from which the, you, the that from which the beings are born even in our uh, own example we can take when we are born means what okay if, 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 where did i where, where where was i born from before birth what was i the answer to the question is here in this verse before the birth of this body i was the atma i'm still the atma i'm when the body leaves i will still be the atma i just have to understand the difference between atma the consciousness principle and the body then chandogya upanishad uh, 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 has this verse sadeva soume damagrasi ekameva dvati adbhutiyam that means before this world was manifest there was only existence it is not an appearance huh? this is where the existence i am when i say use existence is all coming from these upanishads so from this existence consciousness awareness principle the whole world comes like from the sleep state the whole world comes sleep state means from atma only the entire waking state comes from this consciousness sat principle existence principle which is my real nature when i am sleeping this whole body mind comes the world comes therefore we say world is mithya like a dream 
and who is the one who is giving or who is the giver of this ex a lending existence i the consciousness i give existence to three identities these three identities are called as vishwa taijasa prati they are the names given to the waker the dreamer and the sleeper these are the three names for the ego i when the ego i is in waking state it is called as vishwa ego i in the dream state is called taijasa the ego i in the sleep state is called as pragya they are names to differentiate so that i can arrive at turiya which is the pure consciousness like the gold is one but the objects are many similarly consciousness is one the human beings are many that's what it says here with this i will close today i will continue the talk next week uh actually there's only one page why don't i just finish this quickly in two, uh in one minute let me just uh, so that we can yeah there's only one page let me just finish this today so the philosophies which are there are nyaya vaisheshika jain vedanta what is the difference between the th uh, between the different people nyaya philosopher says everything is sat world is also sat jiva is also sat creator is also sat the three sat that means the three satyams that means they are dvaitams some there was a question what is vishishta advaitam uh, 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 so there was a question asked in the chat group this is the difference vishishika says there is asat from non existence comes the uh, from uh, non existence comes the entire existence the jain people this is a portion of the people from india is one group called as jains they believe sat asat mixture and what vedanta says is is sat asat vilakshana sat alak vilakshana means what consciousness is different from matter entirely different and it exists independently that is what is the vedanta school which teaches advaita vedanta 157 to 170 is i said before also it's for meditation for me to drop the notion that i am a jiva i am sorrowful i am a sadhaka i am student all that i have to drop i drop and then i say i am siddha i am ever mukta mukta means i am ever free the moment you have done the analysis of atma and anatma and you have understood the atma clearly what it is you will definitely come to this conclusion that i am always free i give you guarantee this is it's 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 uh, you have to go step by step and then take the conclusion that i am ever free and then you live the life understanding who i am changing from triangular format which i explained to you last week in the nashkirma siddhi i said there are two methods two ways in which the vedas teach binary format and the triangular format remember that if you have not if you don't just revise that portion again when you come next to the class because we will be discussing this portion of seeing the world as a jiva jagat ishvara and seeing the world as atma and anatma that is going to be Uh, studied in detail uh, when we do the highlights so what is the conclusion of this entire shruti sara samadharanam the conclusion is aham satya aham means i the atma am an independent principle i always exist jagan mithya the world i experience comes and goes it is an appearance jivo brahmaiva naparaha i the jiva am none other than brahman the pure consciousness it is one pure consciousness which is satya which is always there which is the substratum which is the adhisthanam 
for the jiva which is the consciousness principle and for the world which is sat pure existence principle pure sat and pure chit are one brahman with that i will close uh, the discussion on this uh, summary portion of the shruti sara samudranam by totakacharya a very very beautiful text analyzing mahavakya portion of the upanishads and concluding with the sentence aham satyam jagan mithya jivo brahmaiva na parma uh, next week we will do this uh, shruti i will just take a feedback from you if you would like to study the highlights if you say yes then we'll go ahead with uh, one more class or two more classes on this highlight portions this highlight portions has got uh, 25 verses from the text in some important verses i have taken so that you can get a glimpse of the text uh, uh, so with that we will close and uh, om purnamada purnamidam purna purnamudachade purnasya purnamathaya purnameva vasishyade om shanti 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 hari om shri guru bhyo namaha hari om uh if i uh, let me see if there are any questions there are four messages in the chat group there is some disturbance in the audio solved okay it's been solved okay amazing to guru and glorifying guru okay we go through the highlights rao okay uh, i knew you would say that you want the highlights i wanted to get the feedback from others so let me understand if uh, you would like to go through the highlights or we go to the next text let me see uh, uh, anybody else would like to go through the highlights anurag uh, you are the new entrant to the uh, class today i am very happy to note that you are here uh he, anurag is uh, from bombay he has uh, he told me that he's, he performed in the esplanade in singapore recently he came from bombay i don't know uh, he will introduce uh, uh, him to us a little later um okay uh, rohit yes you would like to have uh, some highlights i think uh, jiva and amkara um, difference between yes we will study that a little bit more depth in the highlights uh okay then that case we will do the highlights we will see uh, uh we will see the highlights next week uh it's very interesting because uh, it gives you a little bit more depth of what we have studied so far uh especially the mind human mind how to differentiate from atma i mean this is amazing it's an amazing uh text uh because even after you study the uh, mandukya upanishad many questions remain for all of us and uh, let's see Shekhar, okay yeah. yes yeah uh, among the different approaches like uh, atma and atma viveka and uh, the three avastas and uh, the sharirams is there a recommended like what is that? you go i mean the different approaches right among them which is the first uh, approach among the among the three uh, among the three bodies the three states and, and among the five koshas right yeah, yeah. okay very good question sayyid um, see basically in tatvoda we have studied that atma has to be differentiated between the three bodies the three states and the five koshas uh initially in the schools where they teach vedanta they normally take the five koshas first that means they take they take the taitri upanishad first 
to learn okay. about the uh, atma they they learn that the five koshas are not atma at a, after you have done that five koshas the five koshas themselves they cover the three bodies also that means one upanishad covers two portions the three bodies which is the gross body subtle body and the causal body the five koshas are nothing but the three bodies the three bodies means the annamaya kosha is the gross body the subtle the causal body is the anandamaya kosha so these three koshas are not me they are the dresses which i wear for my transactions and the uh, subtle body made up of three koshas pranamaya kosha manomaya kosha vigyanamaya kosha so one upanishad taitri upanishad tells me teaches me that i am not the three bodies or the five koshas after you have done the taitri upanishad and you have absorbed the content that means the content of annamaya kosha is pranamaya kosha the content of pranamaya kosha is manomaya kosha the content of manomaya kosha is vigyanamaya kosha the content of vigyanamaya kosha is anandamaya kosha the content of anandamaya kosha is atma this is how we first understand the differences between the five koshas five koshas are the dress which we wear for transactions in our waking state and sleep a dream state and uh, basically our waking state we put on this coat of this five koshas and we operate who am i without the five koshas i am the atma this is an intellectual understanding only there is no experience where you will say i am alone as atma it is not an experience it is a gnanam so your question is what do i do first the answer is first you do taitri upanishad then you do mandukya upanishad that's all with these two upanishads you have covered the entire uh, just essence of the upanishads come straight to this uh, shruti sara samudaranam and the last portion is vichara sagara vichara sagara is a text which will remove all the wrong notions we have when we do the text you will see the beauty of that text but as of now that's the answer to your question sir uh, is it clear yeah thank you okay anybody else oh shekhar ji ha bolo bhai bhai uh or you the verse six says uh, why uh, anatma is uh, mitya the mitya what have uh, atma to do with the dream uh i will explain to you next week when we do the highlights uh, anatma oh. is mithya is going to be explained in the next uh, next uh, next week uh, talk uh, anatma means it is it is not you see what it means mithya means it is an appearance like a dream see what uh, today for example if i ask you how was your dream yesterday you will say it was it was very nice dream i dreamt a uh, beautiful that i got liberated because of the class i am i i got mukta i am i dreamt i am i am a completely mukta purusha then today what happened that dream is gone so the dream was just an appearance what what did i dream 5 years ago 10 years ago 20 years ago it is all only an appearance it came and went that's all so similarly when we go through our waking state don't take it too too strongly don't keep on analyzing the world too much it is it will come and go it is also like a dream it is mithya mithya means it is like a dream don't take life too seriously just know that i am the consciousness which will always be there with that one knowledge you can have immortality you can be beyond time time cannot affect atma you understand now right yeah yeah correct thank you okay. thank you anybody else 
Okay, we close for the day and then we'll see you next week. Uh, Susanna, you're also there. Uh, I hope you have uh, understood uh, some of these sessions. Uh, are you there, Susanna? Okay. Uh, uh, you, one more question, Sekaji. Uh, bolo. The verse one to eight, uh, you were saying that your nature is moksha. Is it? Yes. But uh, what we believe is our nature is humble masmi, right? Yeah, Brahma and uh, yeah, moksha, mo, yeah, Brahma means what? Brahma means it's a free, it's uh, it's free from the body. That's what we call it, Brahma. And moksha means knowing that having that knowledge now that I am free from the body is called as moksha. It's just a word. Okay. Yeah. You see, uh, okay, when I'm free from the body, that means I come to know that I am the pure awareness. I am the consciousness, which is always there. It is never changing. Yesterday also I was the same. Today also I'm the same. So what is not changing is this Brahman, this consciousness. That name we give it as Atma, Brahman, Pure Awareness, Consciousness, Turiyam. These are all different, different names. But we must understand it is only one principle. And it is the same between you and me also. Between me and Anurag or any, me and uh, Susanna, it's all the same. It's the same one principle, it, which is uniting all of us. Okay, thank you very much and good night to everybody. See, see you next week. Yeah. And uh, Rohit, how did you find the class? It was nice, Shekhaji. I have one clarification though. Um, in the analysis of the Chit and Chidabasa, you said that uh, there is no notion of, I don't know if I wrote it correctly, it says um, there is no notion of I am uh, or the I-ness in the Chit itself. Yes, there is no I am in the chair. That means oh, yeah. for the notion, you need the mind. Without the mind, you can't have the notion. The mind is passive condition in sleep. So that is why we say consciousness is beyond the three states, beyond the three bodies, beyond the five koshas. It's the I same see. thing as Drik Drisha Viveka. He talks yeah, about Chit Chaya, right? Yeah, you the Drik. You are the Siya. Chit Chaya. Yeah, Chit Chaya. Well. Yeah, you are not the shadow. You are the original. You are the original face, you are not the reflected face. So I am, normally when we say, when we, are when we are trying to teach, we say I am is consciousness and I am the body mind is uh, an atma. It, while teaching we say this, but actually speaking, uh, in terms of experience, there is no I am in the sleep state. There's the just avastha. I, is it? Yes. That, that is why we say that is Turiyam, that is, yeah, that is the fourth, that is the fourth compared to the three states, but actually speaking, it is the only state. That is the higher Sorry. principle, the rest is the lower principle. Mm. Okay. The three yeah. avastas, they come and go in Turiyam, in the, in the uh, uh, pure state of consciousness. Mm.